Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Good morning. I just want to say what a joy it is to serve God and to serve you here at FaithBridge. Well, I'm excited to be here today because we are in part two of the series we're calling The Naked Truth. And so if you missed Pastor Ken's sermon last week, he talked to us about God's plan for sex, but how we all as part of a broken, fallen world are prone to sexual sin. So if you missed it, I think you're gonna wanna go back and listen to it because over the next few weeks, we're opening God's word and we're examining the question, how do we think biblically about sex? So if you need a Bible, the ushers are coming forward. Just raise your hand, let them know that you need one. And if you don't have a Bible, please keep this one as our gift to you. Today, we're talking about the gift of singleness and specifically looking at singleness and sex. So some of you might be thinking, okay, so what do singleness and sex, how do, what do they have to do with each other? How do they go together? Well, there's a lot to learn about singleness and sex. And I think whether single or married, we all struggle with our sexuality and we all wrestle with this question of how to think biblically about sex. And I think there's something that we can learn because as we talk about this topic, we're gonna look to Jesus. What better example do we have? It's our goal as Christians to model our life after him. Love, humility, peace, patience, and yes, holiness. But we as Christians sometimes tend to skip over that whole Jesus being a single man thing and not really think about the question, how did Jesus navigate singleness and sex? Well, I'm excited to talk about it, but let me pray for us first and we'll jump right in. God, I thank you for this opportunity to come together this morning to worship you, to praise you, to hear your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come now, that you would teach us that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the truth found in your word. God, I pray that you would come now and bless our time. In your son's name, amen. Okay, so the holiday seasons are upon us, and with it brings a lot of traditions. Decorating cookies, trimming the tree, going to see Santa, and the complicated dilemma of gift giving. Okay, so there's one gift-giving game that I have a love-hate relationship with, and it's called White Elephant. Now, some of you may have played the game. Probably most of you have played some version of the game, but you just show up with your gift, you put it in the middle in a pile, you choose a number, you open them up, and then there's the twist that you get to steal a gift. I recently read a blog post that said, what makes the best White Elephant gift? And they fell into three categories, something funny, something weird, or something nice. And you see, that's where the dilemma comes for me because I like nice gifts. But some people think it's just hilarious to just pack up any old broken thing they can find around their house, like this broken cookie jar that shows up at my in-laws white elephant game every year. And some people think it's just even more hilarious to re-gift something that they didn't really like, like the sweater from Aunt Edna, or if you're Pastor Ken, this box of fruit that shows up in the office white elephant every year. But if you sent the fruit, I'm sorry. It was really delicious. I'm sure someone enjoyed it. So you might get something funny, you might get something weird, or you might get something nice. And I think I have the worst luck ever because I am often sitting, holding my broken cookie jar, gazing in envy at the beautiful scarf that my cousin received. It's clear 
that some people just get better gifts. And I think it's the same feeling, the same envy, the same love-hate relationship that's exposed when we think about the gift of singleness. Singleness, a gift? Isn't it better to be married? Isn't married marriage the ultimate blessing and singleness just something to be endured? I think that's the message that our culture promotes and particularly in the church, promotes this idea that it's better to be married. But scripture has a very different perspective. In 1 Corinthians 7, 7, the apostle Paul writes, and I'm gonna read from the message version because I think it brings a clear picture to Paul's words. 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Sometimes I wish everyone were single like me, a simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of single life to some, the gift of married life to others. Paul boldly declares that both marriage and singleness are gifts from God. And I have to admit that when I first read this, my deeply ingrained cultural bias begins to question Paul because I think if this is what the Bible says, how did we as a culture arrive at this place where we prize marriage, but often assign a less than status to singleness? And I believe that Gary Thomas answers this question with laser light focus. He points out that while our primary concern is happiness, God's primary concern is holiness. We look at singleness or marriage and we ask ourselves the question, what would make me happy? What will make me feel satisfied? But God, he's focused on something entirely different, something with an eternal significance, pursuing holiness, becoming more like Jesus, no matter what state we're in. If our goal is to just be happy, we'll be disappointed. But if our goal is to become holy, to become more like Jesus, then we'll discover that God doesn't value marriage or singleness over the other, and he can use both as gifts in our life. So with the goal of becoming more like Jesus, let's look at three things that Jesus did with his gift of singleness. First, Jesus found fulfillment in God above everything else. Jesus valued human relationships, but he also understood that they could never bring us the fulfillment that our heart yearns to know. We, on the other hand, we make an idol out of our relationships. We think if this relationship is making me happy, then a relationship with sex will make me even more happy. Um, I arrived at college at the age of 18 after being extracted from the bubble that I grew up in, and I knew two things about sex. One, you don't do it, and two, you don't talk about it. And so I get to college, and I'm finding out all kinds of things that I never knew before, things like, um, My parents, who tried their best with their well intentions to protect me and shield me and keep me uh, safe as long as they could, um, they resulted to some extreme measures at times. So I get to college and we're watching the movie Jerry Maguire. And I had no idea that this movie had a sex scene in it because I am so old that we used to watch movies on VHS tapes and you could actually record over parts of those. And so my parents in the screening process would record over the scenes that I shouldn't see. Same thing with magazines. In the censorship process, they would cut holes in the articles or the pictures that I didn't need to read. And so they would come into my room with holes and pictures missing. So it was full of things that I was allowed to read. So we're sitting in the sorority house and we're watching Jerry Maguire and all of a sudden Tom Cruise and Renee Zellwinger, they're like making out, they're like doing it. And I was like, what? How did I never know this? And so I was loved and I was protected, but I was so naive and college and the real world, they were just shocking to me. 
we would watch popular shows like Sex in the City and we would read the popular magazines. I actually brought a couple pictures today. Okay, here is one that is actually from a year that I was in college. These are the things it was promoting. And if we think this is a new problem, it's not because this next one is an issue that came out just this month selling the exact same thing. Sex makes you happy. Focus on your body. Get better at sex and you'll be even happier. And men, unless you think this is just a problem for women, I brought one for you um, to see what they sell to you too. I mean, great abs. That is the key to happiness right there. He looks happy. I mean, no wonder my mom's scissors were so busy. So I find myself at 18 without a relationship with Jesus, struggling with this feeling of not belonging, of not fitting in, of not mattering. And I see my friends and I see these messages and I think maybe relationships, maybe sex will be the thing that fulfills me. And so I jumped right in, thinking that sex would be the thing that fixed what was broken with me, but it didn't. It only left me hurt, confused, and feeling used. Well, by the grace of God, I became a believer the year after college, and two years later, I got married. And while I was beginning to understand what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus, I definitely had wounds and hurts from my lifestyle and my past, and I just rolled those right into my marriage. So instead of looking around at the world to satisfy me or fulfill me, I turned that directly onto my husband. And guess what? Marriage didn't fix me either. It was only until I began a discipleship relationship with a mentor and friend that she began to help me see this pattern in my life of running to people and things other than God to satisfy me. I remember one day we were talking and I was telling her about a recent argument that my husband and I had had. And I said to her, you know, I know that he loves me. I just don't feel loved. He doesn't make me feel loved. She said, well, lovey, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I'm just going to keep on praying that God will change him. And she said, have you ever thought that God might be trying to change you because God loves you. The truth is you are already loved with a perfect love. And it's only he that is gonna be able to satisfy that yearning and that longing that you have in your heart. One of my favorite accounts of Jesus is found in the Gospel of John chapter four. Jesus has a conversation with the Samaritan woman who's at the well getting water. And he begins to ask her questions and we learn a little bit about her. We find out that the man that she's currently with is not her husband, but she's had several of those already. We find out that she's a woman who has been running to relationships and sex to fulfill her. And Jesus says to her in verse 13 and 14, he says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And I think it's interesting that we don't know her name. I mean, it's a famous story. It's probably one of the most well-known. And we don't know her name. And I have thought maybe it's because we can so easily identify with the woman at the well. I could. And there we see Jesus offering her the only thing that would satisfy her, the only thing that she was looking for. And what the woman at the well understood that day is the same thing that I've come to understand. And the thing that Jesus knew, that only God can satisfy us. All those other things, all those other places, relationships, people that we run to, they are just crooked, dead end paths heading to empty wells. And we all have them, empty wells, places we turn to instead of God. I'm wondering, 
Do you know what it is for you? Who is that person? What is that place that you run to to be fulfilled instead of God? Doesn't matter if you're single, married, widowed, divorced, young or old, only God can satisfy us. First, Jesus found fulfillment in God alone. And then Jesus used his body to glorify God. Well, there's no doubt that we live in a body-obsessed culture as evidenced by those magazines we saw, the music we listened to, the TV shows we watched, the movies that we watch. We are bombarded with messages and images about our body, what we do with it and how it looks. And the prevailing thought is that my body is mine to do whatever I want, whenever I want, that I can indulge in pleasures or whatever makes me happy. But God, he has a different plan and purpose for our bodies. And we're talking about it in this series. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. He says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought for a price. So glorify God in your body. As believers, our bodies are not our own. They're holy places created by God for God. But with the social norms loosening around sexuality, what does that mean for us as believers? And in particular, singles. How does a person in singleness honor God with their body? As a single, pursuing holiness means living a celibate life. And there's no point in trying to water it down. Abstaining from sex is difficult. Refraining from sex, keeping your mind and your body and your spirit sexually pure, it's a challenge. And it's swimming against the stream of culture where it's thought that abstinence is repressive or unnatural, archaic, a leftover holdout from the old days. I mean, I was at the grocery store and I read this uh, headline on a magazine and it said, monogamy in marriage is out. And I thought, geez, don't tell my husband. (laughs) (laughs) Committing to celibacy in singleness or committing to fidelity in marriage is committing to honor God with our bodies, to use our bodies for his purposes and his glory. About two years ago, my brother found himself single after a very unexpected divorce. And so I've watched over the last two years as he struggled with his new identity as a single and as he's walked with God and grown. And he told me recently, he said, Lou, God has revealed so much about my heart through my divorce, how I made my marriage an idol and I took my focus off of God And my relationship with him now is more fulfilling and more satisfying than it's ever been. And he says, I've been able to focus more fully on God without the distraction of my marriage. But also, I've been able to take advantages of opportunities that my singleness has allowed me, like going to Ecuador this Thanksgiving to share the gospel in the mountains with friends from his church. He's committed to celibacy and honoring God. And he's using his body to serve others, lead worship at his church, lead his small group. The lie that the enemy would have us believe when it comes to singleness and sex is that everybody is doing it. And it's not true. My brother's life is a testimony to that. Faithbridge is full of singles who are on mission, who are desiring to honor him, to use their bodies for his purposes. Jesus was fully human. He had a physical body like us, and he was tempted like us. It's in him 
that we find the redemption of celibacy and singleness. It's true. Those who are walking a single celibate life have a deeper understanding and appreciation of what Jesus faced when he was here. A single life with affection solely devoted to God are a testimony of God's power to overcome sin in the world. But pursuing holiness won't happen with a just don't do it attitude. Pursuing singleness and celibacy happens as a response. It flows out of a commitment to follow Jesus no matter what. From a heart that desires to honor him and a heart that is filled by him, who wants to be used for his purposes and his glory and to build his kingdom. Jesus used his body to honor and glorify God by remaining celibate and allowing God to use his body all the way to the cross where his body was broken, where he died the painful, brutal death that we all deserve to die. And then he conquered sin and he rose And it's that same power that lives inside of us, that dwells inside our body, that now allows us to glorify God with our bodies. First, Jesus found fulfillment in God above everything else. Second, he used his body to glorify God. And third, he lived his life in community. Jesus understood the need and importance of healthy human relationships. You know, we have this idea that celibacy and singleness is synonymous with loneliness. But that's not the message of scripture and it's not how Jesus lived. Jesus lived his life in community. Study after study shows that the number one concern for singleness is loneliness. That there's a feeling of isolation Especially for those who are longing to share their life with someone or to raise children, singleness can be profoundly painful. And while it does come with uh, freedoms and flexibility, it often comes with a feeling of being overwhelmed, of carrying all the burdens of life on your shoulders by yourself. But God never meant for us to be alone. There is an account of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verses 48 and 50. Someone comes to Jesus and reports that his mothers and brothers are waiting outside to talk to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? And he points to all his disciples and he says, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever is doing the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus creates a new family. It turns out that Jesus defines his family as those who are following him, not those who are related to him. He doesn't devalue marriage or family. No, he very much affirms it, but he does prioritize it in the light of the kingdom of God and the high calling of discipleship. Fellow believers now become our brothers and sisters. And it's a new family where all can belong by virtue of the relationship with him. Young, old, married, single, divorced, widowed. It's a new alternative type of community based on agape love, which is godly love, rather than the natural love you find between siblings, parents, and children. Jesus had many close, intimate friends. And now, when you hear the word intimate friends, you might think, Intimate friends? But in our culture, we use the word intimate in the wrong way. We put intimacy and sexual activity as equals. We think to find intimacy, we must have sex. But the word intimate simply means close friend, someone who's cherished, someone who's devoted, a close friend that's built on a deep understanding of each other and trust. We're created to be in those kind of relationships. They're not surface level. They're the kind Jesus had. Scriptures are full of Jesus with his friends, their conversations, their dinners, their lives. Some were single, some were married, 
Some were men, some were women. I am part of a grow group that about two years ago started to change. We were only married couples and we began to invite our single friends into community with us. This has been life-changing for me. Our conversations are so deep and varied and the viewpoints are so wide. I am learning so many things. Uh, One of the things I'm learning is that nothing devalues my single friends more than when I only focus on their dating life. Are you dating anyone? Uh, How's that going? You think you're gonna get married? No, they want me to focus on how God is using them, what God is teaching them. How can I support you? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? And do you know what we've learned from each other? Singleness has its challenges and marriage has its challenges, but we are all in this together pursuing the same goal of holiness. We are connected and we are bonded, not by our demographic, not by our marital status, but by a deep love of Jesus. We're a new family of brothers and sisters. Christian community is a place where you can have real relationships, but you can be real about your struggles. Four years, I carried around the guilt and shame from my past, unable to move forward, feeling paralyzed by my mistakes, feeling like you have messed this up so bad. You are so far gone. There's no hope for you. Maybe you feel like that today. Maybe you can recognize a pattern in your life like I did where you're running to something. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a computer screen and you feel like I can't stop this. I don't know how to change it. Or maybe you're in a relationship where you've already broken the boundaries and you don't know how to get back. Let me tell you, Jesus was not afraid to befriend sinners, people with past history of sexual sin. In fact, the disciples thought it strange, but he wasn't frightened or inhibited by being in relationship of women of reputation and men of questionable character. And it wasn't reckless, it was redemptive. Jesus came for people just like you and me. He came to rescue us, to set us free from the death of sin. God's grace and ability to forgive are so much bigger than we can ever imagine. You know, I can look back on that time when I was single when I was far from God and when I was questioning God and I can see where I thought of God as this angry dictator in my life who just wanted to put these unreasonable demands and rules on me with a little regard to my feelings or my happiness. And I can see that I got it wrong because God, he's my loving father. And out of his deep love for me, he wanted to put boundaries on my life, safeguards around me so that I would be protected, so that I would be whole, so that I wouldn't get hurt. And then he sent Jesus to rescue me, to redeem me and to heal me and to give me a better life. And he wants to do the same for you. Jesus used his gift of singleness by first looking to God for fulfillment, second, using his body to glorify God, and third, living his life in community. He understood that the key to true and lasting happiness is the pursuit of holiness. It's a paradox. If our primary focus is happiness, we won't get happiness or holiness. But if our focus is holiness, we get both. C.S. Lewis said it this way, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Singleness is a gift and it can be an incredibly fulfilling time. God can use single people in powerful ways. And if you are single, I want you to know that Faith Bridge is for you. 
We know that being single has challenges, and we commit as your brothers and sisters in Christ to being a place where your singleness is valued, where you can pursue holiness. And if you're married, I want to challenge you. Invest in the single people in your life. Invite them into your community. Grow with them. Learn from them. Encourage them and support them. Whether single or married, if you are not in community, I want to invite you to join ours. Fill out your Connect card. Go online. Use the FaithBridge app. Let us know you're ready, and we will reach out to you. Whether married or single, let's pursue holiness together. Let me pray. Father, you are a good, loving father. You love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, not to condemn us for our mistakes, for our sins, but to rescue us and deliver us and to give us life. God, I want to pray today for people who are like me, struggling under guilt, shame, feeling trapped in sin. God, you, your mercy, your grace, your love, it's unending. It's steadfast and faithful. And so, God, I pray that today we would trust Jesus with our lives. We would say, we can't do this on our own. Jesus, we need you. And God, let me say a special prayer for the singles with us. God, I know that it can be challenging. And God, I just pray that your spirit, that your love, that your grace God, that you would just continue to grow our singles, that you would equip them and give them everything they need. And I pray for all of us, all of us here at Faith Bridge, that we would be a family, that we would be brothers and sisters in Christ, whether married or single, young or old, widowed, divorced, God, we know that when we follow you, we enter into a new family. God, I pray that we would support each other in the pursuit of holiness. And Father, we ask these things in your precious Son's name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, welcome to Postscript. I'm Pastor Dan Slagle, and I am with Lou Ann Riley, who has preached the second installment of our sermon series that we're calling The Naked Truth. Today, Lou Ann, you preached about the gift of singleness yes. and how singleness uh, is uh, related to sex from a biblical perspective, mm -hmm. and it's generated some very, very good questions. So let's All right. just jump let's do it. right in. Uh, first person wants to know basically, is Christ truly enough? They write, uh, we sing that Christ is enough and say that he's all a person needs and yet insist that we must be in community and no one should take on the Christian walk alone, especially at Faith Bridge. Uh, regardless of having a romantic relationship in one's life, how do we honestly balance this tension? Well, I think this is a, a really good question because I can see where it could be confusing if you didn't understand. Um, so I think what we have to talk about here is the understanding of when you become a believer and mm -hmm. when you enter into community. So when you become a believer and you profess that Christ is enough for me and that I want to follow him, you enter into the body of Christ. Right. He talks about, and we see all through the Bible, where we're all parts of mm -hmm. the body of Christ. We all belong. Right. And so the Christian walk or the Christian faith is not something that uh, we do in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, that yes, Christ is enough in terms of my life and I can trust in Him and I can place everything in Him, but with it brings 
community and people. And so they go together. Becoming a believer, you enter into community. Good. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. So the next person wants to know about uh, are singles in some way missing out? I've always heard that a marriage relationship is the closest physical human representation of Christ's love for His church. Does that mean that those who are called to be single their whole lives are somehow robbed of getting to fully experience Christ's love for His church? Okay, so when we talk about this, it's kind of one of the things I talked about today, mm -hmm. um, the perception that we do promote marriage, um, and we often don't look at the gift of singleness. But if you look at what Paul's talking about, when he talks about marriage and when he talks about that experience of Christ in the church, he's using that as one of the ways that we experience yeah that, that the uh, marriage relationship is the closest human relationship. But like we said today, the gift of singleness doesn't mean that you can't experience the way that Christ loves the church. Um, you just experience it in a different way than a marriage person would. Right. So Paul's words ab about marriage are not the final word about a relationship with Christ. Rather, they are the final word about marriage right. and a relationship with Christ. Exactly. Still plenty of room to talk about what it means to be single mm -hmm. and walk with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from a concerned parent about uh, the tide of mm -hmm. culture. As a parent of grown kids, we have seen how the moral fiber of today is really difficult for our kids to navigate um, it's a tall order because some responsibility lies in the home, uh, at school, church, and so forth. What do you think about how we deliver change? Well, I believe that the, the way that we go about fighting against culture or this tide of culture is by equipping our children mm -hmm. to do that. Um, they, Christianity is very counter culture. It uh, opens up a lot of opportunities to talk to your kids about what culture believes, what you're hearing, what you're seeing versus what we believe and what you're hearing, what you're seeing. And I think first by modeling that, by right. being a light, by being different than culture, by showing your kids that your faith is real mm -hmm. in the way that you model that. Um, and then also having an open space or dialogue with your children where you can teach them what that means and sure. how they can be different than culture. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of an unrealistic expectation mm -hmm. that uh, our kids are going to change culture. Mm -hmm. they, they will be salt and light in mm -hmm. the midst of it, but culture is going to be what it's going to be. Our job, if I hear you right, is simply to equip our kids to get ready for whatever culture throws in. Yeah, and I think just like I told in my story today that when I showed up to college, I felt very naive. And um, I think that I was more, a little bit more prone to explore things because everything was new to me. I didn't understand what was happening and I was away from my parents. I didn't have another voice in my life except culture right. and what they were saying. And, and I think that I'm, there was an opportunity where maybe if I had been able to learn more about culture and know more that I could have made better decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good segue then to our final question about how we talk to our kids about sex. Uh, this writer says, you spoke in your message about the dangers of bringing up your children in an overly sheltered manner even if well-intentioned. What practical advice would you give parents on how to approach this topic with their children in more helpful ways? Yes, so I definitely think just the underlying denominator is to be able to talk to your children and to start talking from an early age. Um, I can accredit your wife um, to uh, teaching in a Bible study that I was in where she talked about just talking about sex in a very practical mm -hmm. way. Um, I do think when we don't talk about it, but you hear about it at school, yeah. or you hear about it somewhere else, then we're allowing culture, we're allowing other people to shape what our children think about sex. And so even though it feels awkward to talk to my seven-year-old about body parts with the real words, sure. yeah. um, which is one of the things she encouraged us to do, uh, it feels awkward and it feels uncomfortable for me, but I want them to know that mom is a place where we can talk about these things, that I don't Absolutely. have to go to the locker room or wherever to find out 
these things that everyone else seems to know right. and, and, yeah. not, and not get the right story yeah. most of the time. And I think it's so good from a young age to, to lay out God's plan for sex. You know, I thought with the don't talk about it and don't do it, that sex is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's a bad thing. And when you're in rebellion, do you want to do bad, bad things? things. Um, and so laying out God's plan that it is good and it is designed for a purpose in a marriage, in a relationship, and, and just from an early age, having that being the thought process around sex um, and keeping that open dialogue with your kids. Yeah, as Christians, we should be the last people to surrender this very, very important area to the world. To the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's, let's take that initiative. And we do because Good. it's uncomfortable to talk about. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you again for a great, thank great you. message. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time on Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.